talk a little bit about intimate partner virus uh, uh, violence. We talked about domestic violence in the past. This is the more correct, newer term. And I do thank Dr. Bashford for introducing this subject because uh, it's been something I've been talking about for 20, 25 years almost now. First gave a lecture in 1992. And um, I think that um, everybody in this room is certainly an advocate for a uh, female patient or they wouldn't have taken a week out of their life to come and spend this uh, time talking to and listening to experts. Uh, I have no financial disclosures except I do support our local um, uh, safe shelter and I hope you guys have a chance to do the same in your communities. So what are my objectives for speaking to you about domestic violence? Uh, we still are discussing a good definition of it. We still need to recognize the prevalence of domestic violence. We need to discuss the impact of domestic violence on health care. Uh, we can discuss the signs and symptoms that should alert a physician or other clinician to the possibility of domestic violence. I'd like to describe some methods of screening for domestic violence. And I think um, it's always helpful if we can identify some community resources for victims or, or survivors or, and perpetrators of domestic violence. Um, this lecture will also meet your uh, requirement if you're from the state of Florida. We require an um, update on domestic violence every few years. Um, I think in the last year, it kind of got into the news again, didn't it, with all the professional athletes who um, were having difficulties in their home and personal life. It got back into the news because it was affecting their uh, uh, work ability. Um, so uh, domestic violence is a pattern of assaultive or coercive behaviors aimed at establishing control over another individual. It can take many forms. It can be inflicted physical harm. It can be psychological abuse. It can be sexual assault, social isolation, stalking, deprivation, or neglect. It can include intimidation, and it can include threats. So that's my definition, and it is a pretty inclusive definition, but I think it'll help you uh, as you go back and into your practices and, and uh, look for these patterns. So what are the forms of domestic violence? Of course, intimate partner violence is what we're going to talk about today, but it's part of that spectrum of child abuse. Um, I'm a pediatric emergency physician, and um, unfortunately, we do see a fair amount of what they call now non-accidental trauma. And it also includes the spectrum of elder abuse. Uh, those of you who have geriatric populations, my husband always calls us the largest ambulatory nursing home in the world. Um, when I first moved to Florida, I thought that old people lived in Sarasota, Florida, which is true. Old people do live in Sarasota, Florida, but they come visit their parents in St. Petersburg, where my <laughs> husband and I live. So we do have a large senior population. Um, and um, intimate partner viola uh, violence is those abusive behaviors, or are those abusive behaviors, that are perpetrated by someone who is or was or wishes to be involved in an intimate relationship. So there's partner violence and baby violence. So how common is it? Um, I try to update this slide every, every few years um, because it, it changes. When I first uh, started, uh, the numbers were less. I think there is more reporting now, so there's a, a little bit of a reporting violence, just as uh, Don will tell you that uh, you know, tuberculosis took a big surge in the early 1900s because prior to that time, we didn't know what it was. We called uh, patients died of consumption. Um, so there is a, some reporting violence, but, uh, bias, but um, it is very common. 18% of women in the United States uh, have been raped. 51% of those rapes occurred by an intimate partner. 40% were by an acquaintance. 13% uh, of uh, female patients report uh, sexual coercion. And 79% of rape victims experienced their first rape before the age of 25. And 42% of those women, it was before the age of 18. So it really was child abuse. Uh, men, uh, I don't ever want to discount the fact that men can be abused and are, in fact, abused in, in uh, uh, intimate relations. 1.4% of men have been raped, 52% by an acquaintance, 15% a little bit higher by strangers. 5% uh, have been forced to penetrate someone uh, that they did not choose to. 
uh, participate in a intimate act, and 28 percent of male rape victims experience their first rape before age of 11. Pretty daunting statistics, in my opinion. So domestic violence is now more correctly referred to as intimate partner violence. That may help you a little bit to um, categorize those uh, three uh, parts of domestic violence. And I try to do this when I'm speaking about uh, domestic violence. It's hard to do because we always refer to the uh, patient as the, uh, a victim of violence, but maybe it, we can start thinking in terms more of survivors of violence. And um, I think as you change your mindset uh, from victim to addressing a survivor, maybe they can internalize a little bit of that, uh, which is what I hope. 35% of all U.S. women experience MM partner violence in a lifetime. When I started this, uh, we thought it was one in six, so now it's about one in um, three. Ten percent have been raped by an intimate partner. Ten percent have been stalked by an intimate partner. When we first started talking about this, we didn't address stalking, but when you uh, talk to your staff or speak in, in, at uh, medical meetings, you'll find a very large number of women have been uh, victims of stalking. Twenty-five percent experience severe physical violence. Forty-eight percent have experienced psychological aggression, uh, threats and intimidation, and uh, that comes out to about 30 percent. Um, men, 28 percent of all men uh, have had uh, some experience with intimate partner violence. That's over a lifetime. Uh, 14 percent have experienced severe physical violence, and uh, 48 percent uh, report or admit to psychological uh, aggression that they have experienced. I think that's a huge number. I, I don't see uh, adult males uh, uh, in my practice right now, so I'm, I'm a little leery of that number, but I, I uh, always suspect there's some truth behind those. So the national economic burden, overall the estimated cost is $5.8 billion. This is a significant disorder if we're spending that much money. $4.1 billion on direct health services annually. The financial consequences for the individual, for the survivors, are, are they are much more likely to be homeless. They're much more likely to have few uh, financial resources. A lot of times that's one way of their uh, perpetrator controlling them is they have uh, limited access to the finances. There's an increased risk of incarceration, and um, many of them have uh, lost their employment. So I like to ask this question, uh, did you see any patients this week who have experienced domestic violence? I'd say in this audience, I'd say all of you are cognizant of this and probably recognize these patients when they present, but uh, in general audience of uh, physicians and uh, other clinicians, it's, the answer is probably. The question then becomes, do you know which ones? 10% of all primary care clinicians report they have never seen a victim of domestic violence. Um, before I moved to Florida, I did run an emergency department in Georgia because I was often the only female on staff, um, I took all of the domestic violence uh, patients and uh, uh, rape uh, victims. And I remember meeting a sheriff who told me that in their county, they had never had an actual verified uh, female rape victim. It really takes my breath away to say it this today, but this was not that long ago. This was well, about 30 years ago. And I, I didn't know what to say to him, and I said, that has to be a very unusual county that you live in. And he said, well, he said, we have had some females who claimed that they were uh, sexually assaulted, but it turns out that the gentleman had offered them drugs for sex, and of course the gentleman had no drugs, so then the woman was complaining of sexual assault. I said, I suspect some of the men uh, had no intentions of that, and I suspect this is a um, legal manipulation of your system, uh, but we never did quite rule that out, and so I primarily sent the victims to another county. 55% um, of all uh, primary care physicians report that they have never recognized a perpetrator of domestic violence. Now, I will agree that it can be uh, more difficult to identify the perpetrators, um, but I, I think that an informed uh, clinician can do that. 
uh, patients report 11 visits before anyone asks if they are safe at home. Um, in the emergency department, our, our uh, rate is even higher than that. Uh, Dr. Bashford very uh, correctly identified that patients with the multiple GYN, multiple GU complaints, um, very often uh, there's something else going on in their lives. Um, we recently did a chart review, and uh, even though we do the electronic screening, there were um, an average of about seven visits before you could actually document that some individual uh, clinician had uh, discussed it with the family. Um, so identifying abuse. What should a, alert a clinician to the possibilities of violence or abuse? Suspicious injuries, injuries in various stages of healing, some chronic conditions, some acute conditions or illness, a poor response to treatment, uh, certain health behaviors and social issues can also help you identify uh, uh, victims of abuse. What are some of the suspicious injuries? Well, gunshot wounds and stabbings, high on the list. Um, multiple wounds in various stages of healing, uh, ruptured tympanic membranes, facial fractures, loose or broken teeth, uh, burns. Uh, we all are very uh, well educated about the um, burn patterns of child abuse uh, patients, patients who have been dunked in hot water uh, or have uh, cigarette burn marks on their skin. Suspicion pa suspicious patterns of bruising, including strangle marks on the neck, uh, bite marks, finger trip bruising uh, where you can see that where the hand left a print on the extremities or, or thighs, uh, frequent falls with sprains or, or, and or fractures. Um, I was always suspicious in the ER when I would see the same patient back for falls, several visits with falls. Now some, sometimes it was perfectly innocent, but it kind of makes the radar stand up. Serious head injuries, especially if they're, they're repetitive. And the most common uh, suspicion I have is when the history is inconsistent with the injury. Um, if it was a simple fall from, you know, standing level and they have a compound fracture, that's just not consistent. What are some of the acute conditions patients will prevent, uh, present to? Uh, frequent infections. Uh, Dr. Martins gave us uh, several excellent lectures on uh, sexually transmitted infections, urinary tract infections. Uh, during pregnancy can be a real tipping point in these uh, fragile relationships. Uh, um, planned pregnancy, uh, placental abruption, preterm labor, and short intervals between pregnancies. Um, may be a little uh, concern to a, a clinician. Of course, self-harm, suicide attempts, cutting, uh, particularly in the teens, uh, as a warning sign. Chronic conditions, chronic pelvic uh, pain, irritable bowel syndrome, headaches, uh, sleep disorders, uh, depression, anxiety disorders, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, as Dr. Bashard was saying, we've expanded that um, uh, diagnosis to include uh, patients who are in chronically uh, traumatic situations, not just one large acute uh, uh, episode. Uh, substance abuse disorders, eating disorders, and in general, a poor response to treatment may indicate that the patient uh, has been unable to obtain or take the medication. It may be, what did Dr. Betty tell us yesterday? Um, unintentional noncompliance. Intentional noncompliance is when they just didn't take it, but unintentional may be uh, in this category. So what other health behaviors do you look for? Well, any delay in seeking care. If, the, uh, if I see a patient that comes in with an a extremity fracture that's been there for a couple of weeks uh, and is actually in a stage of healing, that's a big warning sign for me that there's something else going on at home that we need to, to talk about. Overuse of services with vague complaints. Um, the lady that comes in with abdominal pain that you look at the record and she's been there seven times with abdominal pain and they never seem to find much on clinical exam or if they've done some testing, the testing may be negative. Um, sometimes the best question is to say, is there someone at home that you're afraid of? Uh, I've done that many times and my residents always go, ooh, how did you know to ask that question? And I said, well, woo, why hasn't somebody asked that question in one of those other seven visits before they saw me? Um, fear with examination, uh, an individual who kind of zones out or is uh, afraid of uh, contact is um, a warning sign. Um, we've all seen children who are, um, can kind of go both ways. I think Dr. Bashard will agree with me about this. 
the abused child can either be very shy of contact or they can be overly clinging. And I think they lear learn that overly clinging because, you know, you can't really get a big swat in if they're too really close to the person who's abusing them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 That that something's happened in that child's life that they're they're looking for a way out. They don't know how to get it. Um, so uh, fear of examination, substance abuse during pregnancy. You know, you can't go through the grocery line without seeing you know the risks of of medication in pregnancy. Um, I I know even in this highly educated group, we have questions about what what's safe for our patients to take, what's safe for us to recommend for our patients. I could tell from the questioning in the last session. But um, a patient who's using substance abuse during pregnancy, you know, there's there's something underlying that. Disordered eating, uh, risky sexual behavior, and a big tip off for me is when the partner won't leave the patient alone or especially if they're answering the questions. You're asking of the patient, you're directing to the patient, and they are, they're answering. So um, when I suspect abuse, um, what I try to say are um, non-threatening statements. I try to make non-threatening statements to the patient. Uh, in I, I will say, in my experience, these types of symptoms are sometimes caused or made worse by stress. Are there any sources of stress in your personal life? And sometimes that will um, let them answer the question. This type of injury is sometimes caused by other people's action. Is there anyone hurting you? And this type of behavior sometimes suggests a problem with safety in a relationship. Is there anyone frightening in, in your life right now? Um, I also, I love this statement because it's like Dr. Bashford saying, you know, because there's an emotional component to every disease, that may be something we're seeing today. And after we've ruled everything else out, you know, we'll, we'll have to readdress that. So I say because domestic violence is so common, I now ask all my patients if they feel safe at home. It's a very non-threatening statement to make, and it at least brings up the possibility that the patient may uh, uh, be able to speak to you. So how do you ask about violence? You, you, you're direct, but you don't pressure disclosure. Um, just asking about it can be helpful to the patient. Uh, try to ensure that the environment is safe and, and private and confidential. It's not really the best place to screen in my triage area where there's 17 more patients lined up behind. Um, they rarely disclose a history of abuse spontaneously, um, but you need to be prepared to ask at a later date. If, if he or she denies suspected abuse, um, you don't want to confront them or challenge the patient. These are adults and adults have to uh, have that independence and have to make their own choices. But you can express concern. Uh, you can describe resources available to the patient. You can arrange for follow-up. And then, of course, you document your concern. I think it's important to validate the patient's experiences. Um, we try to limp listen empathetically uh, uh, to all our patients, but particularly patients who are in a dangerous uh, situation at home. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge the complexity of the issue. You know, a lot of uh, doctors, uh, when I first, not the nurses so much, but the doctors when I first started lecturing about this would say, well, you know, can't that individual just leave? And I said, well, they can, but sometimes they have uh, uh, children that are depending on them. They may have lack of resources. They may have lack of access to resources. So it's sometimes more complex, you know, uh, than, than we first uh, uh, suspect. Uh, we respect the unique concerns of the patient, respect the decisions of the individual, and we want to help put that patient identified needs first. So sometimes they just, they're just they just worried about their arm, and that's all they want you to take care of. But at least you've started uh, a conversation. And you want to help uh, the patient to identify when they can have more control over the situation. Uh, try to address the social and psychological needs of the patient and provide some encouragement. Um, it is important to do a safety assessment. Are you afraid to go home, or do you have a safe place to go or important questions you can ask? Uh, is your pa partner in the waiting room? And if the patient has ever threatened to kill you or himself or herself, your children or your pets, that's escalating levels of severity, and that's when that patient uh, may be finding themselves in danger. Um, we're fortunate in the Tampa Bay area. We have two uh, safe houses. Um, 
one in Tampa and one in uh, St. Pete, and they will provide volunteers to come and actually get our uh, patients if, if that need is there. Um, if there's weapons present, uh, that's an increased danger to your patient. Uh, if there's been an increase in the severity or the frequency of the use, that's also an increased uh, risk to your patient. And also a history of drugs and alcohol. Um, when I f used to lecture about this, I always talked about in our society we have two epidemics. We have an epidemic of um, intimate partner or domestic violence, but we also have an epidemic of drugs and alcohol uh, abuse. Unfortunately, those two epidemics overlap and sometimes it can be difficult to separate them out, but what, uh, what you can do is uh, not, not just blame the drugs and alcohol, but recognize that they can be a component of that uh, risk to your patients. And you need to remember that patients are more likely to be murdered uh, when they are leaving a relationship. So if that individual patient doesn't feel safe in leaving, there may be a, a real um, recognition on her part uh, that it's not safe to do so. You know, as, as educated and evolved as we are, underneath it all we are, are animals, we're mammalian, and we have a sense of personal safety. Now we override it by a lot of features, you know, all of us get into elevators, which is basically a steel box with strangers. Uh, and you would never get a deer to go into a steel box with a stranger. They have more sense than that. Uh, even a, you know, a more aggressive animal is not going to get themselves into that situation. But um, when that woman tells you she, it's not safe for her to leave, um, she's, she's, she's recognizing her own danger or his own danger. Uh, clinician response, maybe we can offer a private place to make a phone call. We can provide community resources. This is always available in my ER. Uh, shelter information, hotline numbers, and referrals for additional care. Um, if it's possible to make a follow-up appointment before the patient leaves uh, the exam room, that's very helpful. And we want to emphasize the importance of disclosure, but also reinforce the confidentiality. Uh, so how do we document these patients? We have a detailed description of the patient's disclosure. Um, we want to detail the description of the, uh, our exam and the injuries. If it's possible to take photographs, that's uh, important. Um, when these cases go to court, uh, some states uh, require, um, uh, some patients have absolutely, they file the, the proceedings against the perpetrator. Some patients, uh, some states leave it up to the individual whether she, she or he wants to press charges. But photographs can be very useful. By the time you get to court, you know, a description of a bruise on an arm or a leg or, uh, are very difficult to recall, but a pic picture is very helpful. Um, but you want to reassure the individual that those pictures will only be used with their permission. You want to record the resources provided, the assessment of safety, and if possible, document a follow-up plan. So some of the social issues to consider uh, is the abuse escalating towards the children. Uh, is the perpetrator neglectful or abusive towards pets? Have they isolated your patient? Uh, have they restricted the number of people or individuals that they can go to for help? Uh, is there restricted access to medical care? Have the, has the individual become estranged from their family or friends? Are they economically dependent on the abuser? Uh, they may be insecure in their job or with job loss. Um, has there been work or, ho or school absenteeism? They're homeless or already in a, a prostitution situation or incarcerated. Those are just higher levels of uh, social issues. Um, lesbian and gay individuals used to, we didn't have much information on it actually, no, not much data, and we thought that it probably occurred in the same proportion as heterosexual relations. However, um, more current data um, from, I, the last data I had was from 2012, Men living with male partners experience more intimate partner violence than men living with female partners. And females living with female partners experience less interpersonal, uh, inter, uh, intimate partner violence than women living with male partners. The big concern, of course, there will be fewer services available. And also, my concern is that clinicians will be less comfortable asking direct questions. Um, just a couple of uh, YouTube things that I didn't get, I, I can't hook to here, but when children witness uh, intimate uh, partner violence, 
they may be two to four times more likely to have behavioral problems. Um, so that can also be a tip off if you're seeing children. Uh, they may, uh, the children may present with depression, anxiety, attempted suicide, substance abuse, risky sexual behavior, violence towards their peers. Um, they may have uh, been involved in a sexual assault. They may become runaways. Um, and in fact, one of my counselors, one of my social workers that work strictly with runaways said that the most common reason a child runs away from home is that it's safer for them on the street than it was in their home environment. And um, so if you're seeing those patients, uh, that's something to keep in mind. So child abuse uh, will occur in about half the homes um, with intimate partner violence. This is my bad news, good news slide. Half of children who are abused will become abusers. And I don't think those numbers have changed over the last 20 years. But the good news is that half do not. It's not 100% learned, uh, learned behavior. So if an individual can see violence, recognize it, that that's not the way they want to behave towards uh, adults in their lives, uh, I think that's encouraging to us and that, uh, that we can make a difference and we can change the amount of violence in our culture. So doctors and clinicians always ask me about reporting. It's mandatory reporting for children and elderly and vulnerable adults, right? Um, and um, there are consequences if you don't report uh, and you see a child. However, um, in adults, the reporting is different. Now, it's mandatory for life-threatening injuries such as gunshot wounds or stabbings, and you just call the local police or county, whichever you live in. Um, the questions still remain in dating violence in teens and what do you do about children who have witnessed domestic violence in the home. Uh, some states do require uh, violence, uh, domestic violence to be reported, but uh, Florida is not one of them. Um, so what are our screening guidelines? These are different agencies that have looked at the screening and the results. Uh, the Institute of Medicine uh, rec recommends screening and counseling for all women and adolescent girls for interpersonal and domestic violence in a culturally sensitive and supportive way. I thought that was very, they put that very nicely. Um, the United States uh, uh, Prevention Service and Task Force, do you, do you, are you familiar with that? US uh, PSTB? It's, it's a, it was founded in 1984. It's an old uh, task force. It's made up by volunteer experts, and they look for um, uh, evidence-based guidelines of screening and, and prevention. And they found in insufficient evidence to recommend for or against routine screening of parents or guardians for the physical abuse or neglect of children. They found uh, insufficient evidence for women of intimate partner violence or of older women or their caregivers for elder abuse. And um, it fell off their scale. You know, they have an A, B, C, D, E schedule, uh, scale and it fell off into the I. So they, they think it might be good, but they, they, could never, they never got any data. ACOG does recommend physicians screen all patients for intimate partner violence. ASAP, my, my uh, college recommends that physicians at least be alert to risk factors as well as signs of family violence with, with each patient environment. And the AAP recommends that questions about family violence should become part of that anticipatory guidance where uh, if you bring up a subject early in the relationship with your patients, you can often affect the outcomes. Um, so screening for uh, domestic violence or intimate partner violence was uh, ensured by the um, Affordable Care Act that health plans now cover an annual screening and counseling for lifetime exposure. I don't know what the reimbursement is and I don't know what the ICD-9 code is, I'm sorry. Uh, evidence for screening, so pro, you know, you're kind of, this is a highly prevalent uh, society behavior. Uh, screening could possibly benefit uh, the individual, improve birth outcomes, reduce intimate partner violence for new mothers, and reduce pregnancy coercion. The CON, which this was uh, reported in JAMA, August of 2012, there was no beneficial outcome, uh, uh, health outcome from computerized screening, which is where the patient sits in your waiting room, checks off for partner violence and or for provision of resource list for women receiving care in primary care health clinics. but. They remained uncertain whether there was a benefit to personally provided counseling. So primary outcome was quality of life measured at one year. 
So how are patients asked? Uh, methods of screening, you can use a computerized uh, questionnaire, written farm. It can be part of your intake history with admission to a hospital. It can be part of your interview by triage or healthcare provider in an office setting. And the types of uh, questions or screening tools used um, I have on the next, uh, next slides. So partner violent screening, you can use have you been hit, punched, or otherwise hurt by someone in the past year? Do you feel safe in your current relationship? Is there a partner from a previous relationship who is making you feel unsafe now? Um, the HITS acronym is hurt, insulted, threatened, or screamed at. I, this one is kind of biased in my opinion because it says how often <laughs> does your partner hurt you, threaten you, uh, threaten you with harm, or scream and curse at you? Uh, a little bit biased, I think, in that screen. Assessing history of abuse, have you ever been in a relationship? Uh, when you were a child or teen, did anyone ever physically hurt you? When you were a child or teen, did anyone force you to do something sexual that you did not want to do? And when you were younger, did anyone tell you that you were worthless or unwanted? Um, as an adult, have you ever been physically hurt or forced to do something sexual you didn't want to do? And screening for ongoing abuse, how do you settle disagreements in your relationship? Do you feel safe? Is there anyone from a previous relationship is, who is now making you feel unsafe? Uh, that kind of goes to the stalking issue. Is anyone forcing you to do something sexual that you don't want to do? Or is anyone following you or harassing you in the community? Um, screening for perpetrators. This is a little harder, um, but I have had the um, situation come that the perpetrators came to me and wanted to know where they could go to get help. And as many shelters as there are for victims, there are very much fewer uh, therapy programs for the perpetrators. We do have one in Tampa. Um, you can say all people argue. How do you and your partner handle disagreements and, and fights? Do your disagreements or fights become physical? Have you used any physical force against your partner? And have you ever pushed, grabbed, slapped, choked, or hit you? And have you ever done that to her or him? And has your partner ever forced you to have sex or perform acts you didn't want to? Um, that can be helpful, and there are resources available for the perpetrators. But this was an acronym that a friend of mine, Dr. Talaferro, developed. Remember to ask routinely. You can ask direct questions. You can document your findings. You can assess for the patient's safety, and you can respond, review, and uh, refer the patient. Uh, one of my uh, heroes, of course, is my husband, but another one of my heroes is Monty Roberts. Monty Roberts is the original horse whisperer. I don't know. Uh, if I hadn't done medicine, I would have gone into uh, animal, animal behaviorism. I trained at Indiana, and there was uh, quite an um, animal behavior department there. But Monty Roberts uh, feels that no one was born into the world to say, you must or I will hurt you, either to a human or to an animal. And um, even though he's nearly my husband's age, he still travels around the world raising money for domestic violence shelters and child abuse shelters. Uh, he's quite a terrific individual. So here's some community resources for you. Um, there are 800 numbers. Um, the Florida hotline is 1-800-96-ABUSE. Uh, the National Domestic Hotline is 1-800-799-SAFE. Um, originally, that was sponsored by the family who uh, owns Coca-Cola. And I thought that that was a wonderful thing that com commerce was getting uh, to help our patients. I'm sure last year, any of you, any football fans in the room? Come on. I am. I, I, it's a great sport. Um, they had some serious problems last year, and they have partnered with the um, www.nomore.org, and that's a very nice website. They've got a lot of commercial sponsors, and they will actually send you um, uh, literature for your patients or for your staff who want to get more involved in, in this issue. Um, some more uh, resources. I've been a charter member for Physicians for a Violence-Free society for a long time. So what's reality? We can't be responsible for rectifying all the violence in our society, but we can be agents for change and we can model better behavior, right? No resident learns to be abusive to, to uh, patients that didn't see that abusive behavior in his mentors or his, his, in his teachers. So we can model better behavior and we can accurately assess, document, diagnose uh, domestic violence survivors. I have some references for you, um, some selected reading, uh, When Men Batter Women, A Guide for Domestic Violence for Physicians is a great resource, a Portrait of a Child in a Violent Home, Gift of Fear, um, that's a, 
book written by a longtime uh, uh, law enforcement individual who says, you know, a lot of times people get into situations where they know they should be afraid. Uh, Monty Roberts' uh, first book, The Man Who Listens to Horses. And these slides were uh, inspired by Dr. Susan Harrison. She's a professor at uh, F FSU who um, inspired me to update my slides and make sure that I hadn't left any references off for you. And she says that she asks her physicians, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? And if not here, then where? I think that's good. My, my pearl, I like to put a pearl at the end. Uh, violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. So thank you very much. Okay. I'll take questions, comments. Yes, that's a whole nother lecture. Okay. Right. It is a huge issue. Uh, we have a um, uh, initiative in Florida where we're looking at this uh, more seriously. The numbers um, are shockingly high for people who live in uh, our world of education and opportunity. But um, if you uh, feel you are seeing a patient with, uh, who's involved in human trafficking, the best advice I can give you is try to keep that patient in there as long as you can. Because um, the commitment of the abuser uh, will be tested the longer you keep it. And that may help you identify that that is a real situation. But that being said, you, you realize that these individuals don't play by the same rules you and I play by. And you can't endanger yourself or your staff. But if you have a suspicion, um, the states are now setting up hotlines. Florida has a hotline. And if you suspect you've seen a, a victim of um, sexual trafficking or uh, human trafficking, you can call that line and let them, their investigators take over. I, I appreciate your empathy for the um, individual, but I would hate to see you put yourself or your staff in danger. Oh, I am very sneaky. I, um, of course, in the ER, I, I have a little bit more um, latitude than you might in your offices, but I often say, you know, I want to continue this exam, but I need to use a, a different room for just a minute. You stay right here. Would you stay with her purse? I mean, I use any strategy I can to get them separated, or I may say I need a urine specimen or a spit specimen or anything I can think of to get them away from that individual because, yeah, you won't, you won't get the opportunity. I keep the cards for the shelter in my pocket and I will tell them to put it in their shoe and to look at it later because you can't be gone long. They'll get suspicious. Um, but, yeah, anything I can do to get them out of the room, uh, it, I, I do. <laughs> I'm shameless. Any other questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, I think that's that's a very hard thing to. Uh, that's a, one of the biggest reasons that women don't leave is because of that fear or being separated from their children. They they understand the danger to themselves and to their children. However. Um, a great number of these patients do leave their abuser. And sometimes you can be that individual that performs that first real look at the patient. I recognize you and I recognize your value. And I, I'm asking you about this and I understand if you can't talk to me today about it. And sometimes just planting that seed will make a difference in that patient's life. But you can't be the one to decide when they're going to leave. You're right. Very good point. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm sure they've got another one more speaker for you. Dr. Martins is coming. Thank you.